set three or four habits that you want to create for yourself in a list of six. So find six habits and decide every day you're gonna do four but never compensate day to day. There's reasons for doing this. Let's say one day it's train if you're not, you know, run if you're not already doing that, write if you're not already doing that, gratitude practice, NSDR, and then let's just come up with one, I don't know, eat a vegetable. So you're going to list those out on your calendar and then every day you're going to do at least four but as many as five. But if one day you only get one, you don't carry over and do 10 the next day. If you understand the dopamine system, you'll understand why. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to train up a circuitry for giving yourself random intermittent reward for performing these habits on a regular basis. So people will go do these heroic workouts or they'll do a ton of stuff and then they'll reward themselves and they've just undermined the whole process of being able to do that consistently. I, it's a little complicated, but the way that reward schedules work is you're trying to teach the circuitry to work regularly, be rewarded only every once in a while and at random. You look to the neuroscience of habit building, you would be wise to put certain habits at the early part of the day and certain habits at the later part of the day. I call phase one of the day from zero to nine hours after waking. That period of the day, assuming that you're getting that sunlight exposure and a little bit of movement, but even if you're just getting some sunlight exposure, is going to be associated with high epinephrine, high dopamine, slightly higher cortisol, Certain habits we could call linear habits. It's in, it, these are things that you know how to do and you just need to do them. And so those sorts of habits would go well in that zero to nine hours. Then phase two, go from about 10 hours till about 16 or 17 hours after waking. We tend to be a little bit sleepier. We tend to be a little bit calmer, at least, not necessarily sleepy. It's clear that other habits that have to do with what we call non-linear brain operations, things like creative writing, brainstorming with a group, brainstorming with yourself, analytic work that is where there is no clear right answer. It's not plug and chug. It's more exploratory. Go best in the second phase, phase two. I was thinking about, you know, rolling jujitsu earlier. I have, I've, I've, can't even call it rolling jujitsu. I've only done it once, but clearly there's a lot of moment to moment creativity and kind of sorting things out. Whereas weightlifting, it's sets and reps. You're trying to complete a certain amount of sets and reps. You're trying to cover a certain amount of distance running, linear versus nonlinear. And then of course, there's the 17 to 24 hours, which is phase three. And during that time, you want to be engaging one set of habits, which is sleep, okay? Roughly, it could be 16 to 24 hours, et cetera. So try and put the habits you're trying to form into the times of day in which those will actually be easiest. This sort of violates the earlier rule of try and access limbic friction. If there's something that you're really trying to adopt, more exercise, and that exercise is running a certain distance in a certain amount of time, put that in the early part of the day. If you're trying to get, do creative work, do in the second part of the day. If you are trying to develop a new skill that's exploratory, second part of the day. If you're trying to learn a skill that has defined steps already, it's linear, early part of the day. People will just find that it's simpler to do it in that fashion. The other thing is that if you look at the science of goal setting, there are clear data. There's a woman um, at New York University, Emily Balketis. She's described that while we like to think about envisioning success as the best way to set goals and develop new habits, it turns out that at least the research shows it's far more effective to imagine the catastrophic effects of failure. It's the darkness none of us want to embrace, but fear is the more powerful motivator. But provided you can still think clearly, you don't want to put yourself into a state of panic. So goal setting of if I don't do this every day, I'm looking at diabetes and early death is going to be a much more powerful motivator than imagining you're going, oh, I'm going to be, you know, 10 pounds lighter and, you know, I can, you know, bench press 15% more by Christmas this time of year. It's great to have goals. It's also great to have motivators that are based on real world fear. We should also recall the dopamine reward system. The best way to reward yourself for a job well done is random intermittent reward. We've been talking up until now that, you know, effort reward is the cycle, reward that cycle, effort reward. But remember dopamine, non-infinite, but replenishable. How about not spend it at all? How about use what the casinos use in order to keep yourself into a state of motivation? So if you are checking off the boxes, I did this behavior, this new habit, that new habit, that new habit, great, do that but don't celebrate every win. Celebrate random intermittent wins. What does your morning routine look like at the moment? Morning routine is wake up these days around 6 a.m., 6.30 a.m. I'm trying to go to sleep by about 10.30 p.m. When I wake up, I make a beeline for sunlight, so I'm gonna get sunlight in my eyes. You know, I'll probably go into the grave saying this, so forgive me if people have heard me say this before, but 
the single best thing you can do for your sleep, your energy, your mood, your wakefulness, your metabolism <laughs> is to get natural light in your eyes early in the day. Don't wear sunglasses to do it. it takes about 10 minutes or so. If you live in a cloudy area, maybe you resort to some artificial light as a replacement, but as much as one can get bright, natural and if not natural, artificial light in your eyes early in the day. I hydrate, I drink water, and then yerba mate is my favorite form of caffeine. I do everything I can to not do email, not do social media, and to take care of a few critical tasks. These days, I have this obsession with trying to do one cognitively hard thing a day, one, and one physically hard thing a day. In that 90 minutes, I'll typically try and read a research article start to finish, or I'll work on a document that I might be doing a grant or research paper or planning a podcast or researching a podcast. I try and get my brain into kind of a linear mode. I try and narrow that aperture. Because so if I don't, the distraction that's created by social media and interactions with others can kind of wick out into the rest of the day. So I'm not necessarily trying to finish something in that time, but I try and do something challenging. I generally will then do some sort of physical workout. I have a very consistent routine. I've done it for 30 years where I weight train for 45 minutes to an hour every other day. And occasionally I take an extra day off. Mm. You know, the brain will follow the visual system in so many ways. So if you really want to enhance your ability to focus, mm -hmm. put the phone away for two minutes, literally two minutes, just put it across the room or in another room, sit down, pick a point on the wall, and just try and relax, breathe however you want while maintaining visual focus for 120 seconds on a location. You can blink if you want to. Uh, if you don't need to blink, don't blink because actually every time you blink, you reset your time perception. Just sit there and try and extend the amount of time that you can focus. What you'll find is it, it's incredibly boring and agitating like most things you need to focus on and have a hard time focusing on. So we all can focus much better on things we really, really enjoy. But just a little bit of focus training for two, three minutes every once in a while will teach you to recognize when you have that impulse to get up and move or suddenly jump to another activity. And what you'll find is that it carries over to a really terrific ability to read, to study, to listen. And you start to notice those internal signals, like why the urgency to move? Why the urgency to go away? Well, maybe the conversation's no good and you want to get away. That's fine, that's a different matter. But there's something you need to do and you don't want to do it or you can't focus. It's fine to think about hydration, food, caffeine, that's great. But chances are you just haven't really taught your brain how to focus. So start with your visual focus and then let your mental focus follow that. I still do this for a couple minutes each day. I'll go outside, I'll take a walk, which is no focus, everything just walking by. And then I'll finish by, instead of looking at my phone, I'll try and just pick a point and look at that point for a short while. And, and then I'll just sort of notice, huh, that was actually a lot harder than you might think. But I do believe that being a high functioning person in any domain of life is being able to control your impulses to do something different.